So hi everyone, welcome to uh, this week's Magnet Seminar. It's good to see uh, another good uh, turnout today. For those who, who are new to our seminar series, um, we will have a sort of 20 to, to, to 30 minute presentation. And we kindly ask that you uh, keep your microphones muted uh, so as not to interrupt the speaker. If you are having problems with your um, video uh, connection and your internet connection, uh, turning off your video um, can actually help in, in improve that. At the end of the session, um, we'll have time for, for a 10 to 15 minute question and discussion section. Um, we'll ask you to, to raise your hands via Zoom. If you don't want to um, ask your question in person, by all means, please just type it into the chat and um, myself or one of the other uh, co-hosts will um, read it out for you. Uh, and at the end of, uh, of, of our seminar, we'll have time for an informal catch up, a bit of a social um, um, aspect if people are interested in, in hanging around for a chat. And this part of the seminar series isn't recorded, um, so it won't appear um, in, in the public YouTube channel. So today, uh, I'm pleased to say that we have Sanja Panowska from uh, GFC Potsdam in Germany, and she will be talking about um, some long term global models of geomagnetic uh, field behavior. So I will pass over uh, to you, Sanya. Thank you. Th thanks a lot. So I start sharing the screen now. Um, well, it's my pleasure today to present our recent work on long-term global geomagnetic field models uh, with special attention on geomagnetic excursions limitation on the models um, attempts to try to uh, overcome some limitation and applications and actually one application production of cosmogenic size of production rates. Um, so it's a, a list of collaborators here, more or less in the order the study appears. And because I will speak about excursions a lot, um, almost on every slide in this presentation, what a better way to, to explain what these, these events are for those of you who haven't worked on. Um, and here's magnetic field lines from the, um, historical field model, uh, but the field looks very similar today. So it's dappled dominated. This is epoch 19, 1900 AD. And then on the other hand, on, on the right, right hand side, we have the La Chambre excursion that happened 41,000 years ago. And it's the, the best documented excursion and the most recent global event. And we, we see later why and uh, how many there are more. Um, and this La Chambre excursion is from, from a model that I will present in, uh, short, shortly. Uh, so we know that magnetic field is constantly changing in time and space, and the, the two most extreme variations are reversal and excursions. For the, for the reversal and excursions, the field um, dramatically decrease in intensity and also exhibit um, multipolar behavior as, as presented here for the, for the La Chambre excursion. So um, the motivation for the study uh, from, from direct observations, and uh, here I plotted the IGRF model in, in figure A, uh, we know that the axial dipole is decreasing, the intensity of the field is decreasing, that's for the past 100 years, and we can uh, uh, use here one forecast of the model and see that the field will uh, continue to decrease or to decay for, for the next uh, one, 100 years. So it's, it's a question, uh, uh, that's the open question, will the field go to a reversal or excursion? And we will have a look uh, on this question from, from paleomagnetic field models. Um, and for, for building these models, we use um, paleomagnetic records from sediments and uh, rocks, lava, lava flows. Um, and this is one example record from Black Sea measured here in uh, GFZ. And one of the best records we have on, on this time scale, uh, this is 0 to 700 years ago. So we have the three components, declination, inclination, and intensity, and the, the red lines are the La Champ event that I mentioned. Uh, and, and what you see on this time series that for, for, for this event, for this excursion, we have a large deviation in directions in both declination and inclination and a low field intensity. Uh, then we can have having global models, we can have a look at how low was the field globally. And this is here one example, we'll have more and uh, time dependence later, few snapshots of the field. Um, but for a start, uh, this is for an older model, 100K, GGF 100K. And we compare this uh, field intensity at the Earth's surface with the, with the present day field on the same color scale. Um, the black line is the South Atlantic anomaly, so the region with the lowest field intensity we have today. Um, and over the La Champ, um, more or less the, the 
maximum field intensity, it's lower than the one we have today over the Southland anomaly. So it gets really low globally. Um, just a short overview of what exists on these long time scales. And uh, this figure I've, I've made and I've included models that cover the, the Holocene, which are not here because the picture gets really long. So there are a couple of models um, that exist on Holocene time scale. On very long time scales, we know about the time average fields for million year, five or 10 million years. Uh, for the period in between, we have um, two kind, kind of models of reconstructions. One are global uh, spherical harmonics uh, colored in green here, and the others are stacks or paleo, relative paleo intensity stacks or uh, axial dipole moment variation curves uh, in, in blue, dark blue for the global or um, light blue for the regional. And we have intensity records from, from, a, from a given region. So for the for the global models for the green one we have a few um, actually two and and three actually now for the for the Le Champ event uh, one model for the uh, for the Iceland Basin excursion two for the Matuyama Brun and the longest reconstruction that we have so far it's uh, that goes beyond the Holocene the GGF hundred K model um, but today I'll present uh, and, and the newest model the seventy K which we try to to get a uh, a better resolution compared to our previous reconstruction. Um, and that's the only slide we, that I have from the, from the Hadra K model, just to, to, uh, to say we can reconstruct the field in time and space globally, a um, few snapshots compared to the present day field. Um, and I have to say in this, in this model, um, this model is built with, um, it's based on a, on a considerable amount of data over 100 records um, and we really didn't have, we, we had really loose criteria. So the, the, the in loose criteria in, in um, selecting the records, only records that were independently dated. So it means that records dated with uh, RPI or, or paleocycle variation correlation were not included in the model. And we have some records with uh, low resolution. We tried to overcome this with some smoothing kernels. Uh, also, some inconsistent in age. So, in, in general, the model the model is uh, rather smooth. Um, and we learn from this model, and we to the to the other end, we say let's use um, a really strict selection criteria. I listed here globally distributed size, high resolution data, meaning meaning high sedimentation rates, three components, and well dated. Um, and updated chronology. So here is the list of the records we used. And this, this is a challenging task. So for the, for the data available, we selected nine records. Um, the red means that the rent in the, in the list denotes the, when we updated the age model. On the map and on A, we have the location on these records. And the, the color map is the, the sensitivity kernels which means, and this map is, a, so it's an average over the past 70,000 years. And um, also that gives indi indication about the number of data in, this, in, in these records. In, in general, um, no, no record, no, no location, no, no region is unrepresented, but um, we, we see some, uh, some um, low, low sensitivity regions. For the temporal resolution, uh, so the temporal distribution, uh, we have the, the plot on B and the, the temporal distribution of data does not uh, vary much. So we have more or less all the periods covered by data. The number of data goes a little bit lower towards the both ends of the model and it, it covers the period of 15 to 70, so it does not include the Holocene. Uh, a few details about the model not giving equations. Uh, I mentioned the selection criteria, then the paleo intensity records were, were calibrated prior to the inversion. This is in contrast with the 100K model when we included the absolute data from GMO GMP into the model and calibrated the records within the inversion here. Um, Archaeo and volcanic data were not used in the model except for indirectly uh, calibrating the records. Uh, declination are related to zero mean, excluding the transitional periods. Um, for the uncertainty estimates, so equally weighted all records with five micro Tesla for intensities and alpha 95 of 8.5 degrees for directions, and these are converted to standard deviations. Um, so the spherical harmonic basis function for the spatial representation, uh, cubic B splines with no spacing of 50 years for the temporal dependence, 
uh, starting model, starting the inversion from the axial dipole. Uh, we use iterative outlier rejection of five standard deviations, but the, the amount of data that we rejected in the final model is really low, and the normalized misfit is about one. Um, so let's analyze some characteristics of the model. Uh, on the first, uh, in A, we have the dipole coefficients variation in time G10, G11, and H11. Um, the, the gray bars are the three excursions we have in this period in the region Greenland Sea at about 65,000 years ago, La Champ at 41, and Mono Lake Auckland at about 34,000 years ago. So what, what we see from the, the first three uh, coefficients from the dipole coefficients is that the axial dipole signif significantly vary in time, but the other two, the equatorial dipoles, G11 and H11, they um, they vary or oscillate more or less on the same on the same level in transitional times and in non-transitional times. The axial dipole is reflected in that dipole moment variations, and we uh, we see that the dipole moment uh, it's lower over over the Lachamp. It's about I think five percent of the present day field. I think or it's five was from another model, so one point five percent from this model. Um, from the Norwegian Greenland Sea, we have about twenty percent of the present day field, and for the Mono Lake about. 40% uh, of the present day field. Uh, for the dipole latitude, we see variations or, or deviations for all the excursions were small for the Mono Lake and for the Norwegian Greenland Sea about 60 degrees. And for the La Champ, uh, it goes to the opposite hemisphere to minus, minus 15 degrees. Um, and, and the last one is the average PSV index over this time period and the, uh, the threshold we suggested for distinguishing transitional and non-transitional states of 0.5. Um, and this combines the, the dipole moment variations in the, the, pole, the pole position. So um, anytime the field is low and we have large deviation, the index goes up. For the Lachamp excursions, it's obviously uh, the, this is the average, so global average. It's above the threshold uh, for the Norwegian Greenland Sea as well. Here we have a, a second kind of uh, increase. Uh, again, we interpret this as a part of the Norwegian Greenland Sea. And then uh, for the Mono Lake, um, that does not reach the threshold. Though I have to say, I, I'm not presenting here the, uh, the PSV index as, as a map, but um, uh, for the for the mono lake, we have some regions when the index in increase above the above the threshold, but the mean the mean value is below. Um, and now let's look at the morphology of the field. Um, on the left hand side is the total field intensity at the Earth's surface uh, for the three events: the region Greenland, Sea, Champ, and Mono Lake. And this is a period of two thousand years uh, about around these events, uh, and, and the time step is two hundred fifty years. Uh, the all plots are plotted on the same color scale. And here it's a comparison with the IGRF 2020. Um, it's truncated, I think, to degree six as for, the, so for comparison purposes. And on the right hand side is the, again, the same events and the same uh, periods and time steps for the radial component of the field at the CMB. So looking at the, at the field intensity first at the Earth surface. Um, it's really noticeable that for the La Champ event, the field gets really low for extended period of time and globally low. Um, whereas for the Norwegian Greenland Sea, uh, it gets lower, but the, the minimum field intensity stays in the equatorial region or the mid latitudinal regions. Um, for the Mono Lake excursion, the field is decreasing, but still, uh, I think we can see that we have some dipolar st structures still observ observable for, the, for this period. Um, for the for the BR for the radial component, oops, no. Um, for the for the radial component the, at the CMB, um, think of it as a as a flux. So the blue is inward, the red is outward, and when you see red in the northern hemisphere, it means reverse flux patches, and blue on the on the southern hemisphere again means reversed. And and a, appearance of these reverse flux patches will decrease the dipole moment or the field intensity. Um, so what, what is similar for the, for the three events is for when the fields start to decrease, um, this uh, reverse flux patches appear in the equatorial region and, and move towards the poles here, for, for example, towards the, the northern hemisphere, northern poles and, and the south poles for, for these reverse flux patches for all events. And um, 
for the Lachamp, the uh, it's a very really, really complex morphology, reverse and normal fax patches everywhere. Um, and another um, the difference between the Lachamp and the Norwegian Greenland Sea and Mono Lake excursion is that um, the reverse flux patches for the Lachamp event, uh, they move toward the poles and they enter the, the tangent cylinder, cylinder uh, in both hemispheres and stay there for an extended period of time, which is not the case for the other two. So maybe this, this is one hint if, if excursions are, are regional or global events. And um, because we have a global models, we can have a look at the regional differences. Um, and here it's in terms of time series or, or predictions. So I, I took the locations when we have records and, and um, estimated predictions and plot them here as the virtual dipole moment, VGP latitude and the PSV index. So, um, and I forgot to mention that from this model, from the GGF SS70, uh, the axial dipole term actually reverses for a short period of time of 300 years. Um, and this is um, as a result of the intensity records that build the model and they have this uh, uh, dipole low. So at the mid of the Lachamp excursions, we have a low, then the field uh, increases intensity and then decreases again. So this increase in intensity, the midpoint is reflected in the G10 term um, growing in the opposite direction. So the, the gray by here is this, this time period. Um, what is um, interesting is that uh, for all of these locations, which are globally distributed, when the field starts to, to decrease, uh, it's decreasing at the same time or, or simultaneously for all locations. But then the behavior after how it develops really varies from location to location. And that's the same is true for the VGP and reflected also in the PSV index. And you see in the in, in the index that sometimes uh, this is the, the dashed line is the, the threshold. Um, so sometimes it, it goes above the threshold. So it means the field is in transitional state at this location, but uh, can go down uh, in a normal kind of state and then go again in transitional state. Um, and we use this um, the, the PSV index on the, on the global scale as a, as a measure to find the duration of this event. And um, so every time it, we use this threshold, so when the PSV index go above 0.5, we say this is the start a, starting age, and then uh, when, when go it finishes and go below 0.5, it's, it's the end age. I have here the, the start age and duration, which is the difference between the, the, the start and the end age. And because of this simultaneous behavior here, um, the, the start age that does not vary a lot. Of course, we see that it doesn't start, the Lachamp doesn't start, uh, everywhere at the same time, but pretty close. And uh, the differences uh, in the end age are reflected in the duration. So from, from for this model, for the Lachamp excursions, we have a duration um, of about 500 to 3,400 30, years, uh, with a mean of a value of about 1,800 years. Um, and I have to say the number we get for, for the duration, of course, it depends how you, how you measure it. Uh, how and which model model you take, but I think we're converging towards the duration of the Lachamp excursions because using using different models as well as uh, I did an analysis on the raw data that built the 100k model. The numbers we get are uh, 1600, 1300 uh, for one value uh, for RPI stack. The duration was estimated to 1500, so we are more or less on, on this range for the for the Lachamp excursion. And then let's look at the energy uh, axial dipole versus non-axial dipole at the CMB at the Earth's surface. And here I compare the three events. So the Norwegian Greenland Sea, Lachamp and Mono Lake, uh, axial dipole and in, uh, in dashed line, the non-axial dipole. So for, for all, all of the events at the CMB, uh, we have this, the same energy or similar energy for the, for the three events, except for the Lachamp and the axial dipole, it uh, decreases ex extremely here. Um, at the Earth's surface, um, uh, expectedly the dipole it's it's larger than the non-dipole, um, except for for the Lachamp. Again, here um, for the Norwegian Greenland Sea, we have uh, again a decrease in the in the axial dipole energy, but this is more like one order of magnitude, uh, and for for the Mono Lake is even less. And also the Mono Lake, um, the, the starting, so this is 5,000 years before and after the excursion, the midpoint of the excursions, the Mono Lake is lower than the two events. And this is because of the, how the field recovers after the Lachamp. Um, 
And I have a figure here, which is from another model uh, called LS mode point two, uh, which is shorter. So cover the Lachamp exclusion and the mono lakes, uh, the period 50 to 30,000 years. And um, this model is agreed quite well with, with, this, uh, with the seven decay model. And um, what, what we, su we suggested for, for the Lachamp event, uh, in this schematic, when you see the uh, the level of the dipole power and, and the non-dipole power, so the non-dipole power in this mode and also in our mode, um, in our model, stay on the on the oscillates on the similar level. Um, so the dipole is this all on the CMB. It's uh, it's higher for the pre lachamp state then. Uh, decreases extremely, and when it recovers, the dipole it, it it does recover, but not on the state uh, as in pre Um And this situation allows for appearing uh, regional, more regional confined excursions like the mono lake, and we can have like a mono lake, uh, like like a double event, uh, a low at thirty four, or even even after at thirty one or twenty eight. Um, and also it may explain some other exclusions like that appear later, like Helena Palio, you see some um, different ages for Helena Pali from, from 70,000 years to, to, to 22,000 years. And as I mentioned, this data set, the data set we have are uh, limited in time and space in, in resolution and implementation rate. Um, so uh, this is one attempt uh, to, to build uh, the first multi-proxy uh, global geomagnetic field model. Um, we know that cosmogenic isotopes that are produced in the atmosphere um, depend on the geomagnetic field and the, the, the solar magnetic field. Uh, after the production, they are deposited, and I will speak about this later, they are deposited in ice and sediments measured. And um, depending on which time scale you look, uh, they can be proxy for the solar variability or the geomagnetic field. And on the time scale we are looking here, uh, they are considered to be a proxy for the geomagnetic field. So I compiled the data set. Um, there are more records than, than presented here or used in this uh, study. Um, and by coincidence, there are nine records, uh, the same number as the paleomagnetic one. And actually, the first attempt was to improve the 100K model. But because of the really large number of paleomagnetic data, it was difficult to, ask, to, um, to assess the influence of the beryllium-10 data in the paleomagnetic field model. So uh, I end up using the, the 70K model, GGFS 70, and complement the paleomagnetic records with beryllium-10. Um, so locations are given here. We have three records from, from Greenland, farm from Antarctica, uh, and five sediments, I think, Portuguese margin, South Atlantic, and West Equatorial Pacific. A uh, number of records is not really, I mean, high com compared to the paleomagnetic, um, and we have increased number of data here over the Lachamp excursion. The first step towards including these records in geomagnetic field models is to, um, to convert the beryllium-10 to, to paleo intensity. So, uh, in the end, uh, the code does not distinguish if these are beryllium-10 or, or paleomagnetic. Um, not going into details, so this is how the dependence look like between beryllium-10 and, and the ADM. Um, I have to say the beryllium name is also normalized, so think of it as a, as a RPI, so NRM over some, some normalizer to, um, to cancel some environmental or climate, uh, climate effects that you have in the signal. Um, after we get the, and here is the same record. This is a, a record from the West Equatorial Pacific, uh, how it looked like uh, uh, as, as a function of age. Um, the, the record, the raw data are the, the blue and converted to VADM uh, is, is the red. And we also smoothed the record uh, so we don't have some solar, so-called solar influence in it. Um, and they all can, they, they, they come into a relative form and we use the same arthromagnetic and volcanic data from GeomaJ in PIN databases to, uh, to calibrate to absolute before enter them in the model. Um, just to show you that the two types of records, the two types of proxy uh, show similar signals or similar variation. I created a stack based on the paleomagnetic data, an axial dipole moment stack. Um, in, in blue for the paleomagnetic data and beryllium 10 based VADM stack um, here. And they, they, co they compare quite well. The beryllium 10, especially for us, they have this 
um, high intensity values here and it's reflected in the dipole moment and some discrepancy, but can also be a problem with, with ages. Though with the data set uh, compiled, there are more records, but we again try to extract records, beryllium 10 records with uh, the robust results in terms of beryllium 10 and H. Um, and then uh, I have three models here that I compared the one based on paleomagnetic data uh, second one, GGFS 70 10 b um, that used the beryllium-10 the same way as paleomagnetic records. And some studies show that uh, beryllium-10 um, uh, only reflect the dipole moment variation. So this was a test to see if we can use the beryllium-10 to influence or, uh, or to be uh, a function of the dipole coefficients only. So the 10 b deep means it's a beryllium-10 are considered as a function of the first three Gauss coefficients. So these are the, 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 the three models I'm comparing here. And um, just as an example, uh, I give you two locations. The first one is Black Sea and paleomagnetic data and no beryllium 10 in the region. And the, the second location is uh, Greenland ice core and beryllium 10, the, um, the black uh, circles here. Um, what we see here, the, 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 the three models agree uh, well and actually no, no variations uh, in, the, in the models. But in the region, when we have beryllium-10 data, um, we, we have some variations. And uh, re reflecting the global feature, the dipole moment, uh, including the beryllium-10, uh, smooth out a little bit the, the Lachamp excursion. So the dipole, we get a higher dipole moment over the Lachamp, and, and also there are some differences. Um, I compared the fit to the data because it's difficult to judge which, which of the two models that, that includes beryllium is better. Uh, and the misfit to paleomagnetic data, to beryllium 10 data combined the two, uh, is better for the, for the GGFS 7010B. Uh, but I think still uh, there is some work to be done on beryllium 10 before judging. Uh, and uh, the last point is application, and that's uh, cosmogenic isotope production rate over the past 100,000 years. Um, so you see, I use beryllium-10 uh, to try to uh, improve the models. And here is a different, different uh, on the other side, we can use the paleomagnetic field models, the global reconstruction uh, to predict the production in the atmosphere. And um, here I have the LS mode. Uh, on, on the next slides, I have uh, the all models. And the results I'm going to show you are based on beryllium-10. Uh, I have estimates for, for other isotopes, beryllium-7, uh, carbon-14, and others. But the, the conclusions uh, I've made are the same for, for other isotopes as well. Um, so we have the in blue, the dipole moment from an LS mode from 50 to 30,000 years. And I selected uh, three epochs. So time when the field is uh, larger than the present day field, which is dashed line here, IGRF, um, the mid of the Lachamp excursion and the, the Mono Lake. And these are presented here. This is a, a global um, average columnar production of beryllium 10. Um, so for the, for the case when we have a very high field, the Lachamp event, Mono Lake and uh, 2020. And it's, um, Often it's cons considered that the field, uh, because of the dipole dominance, you see the altitudinal uh, dependence in the production rate, which is presented here. When the altitudinal, you see the production as a function of, of latitude. And it is, I mean, it depends on the latitude for the three cases, except for, for the Lachamp, when we have this, uh, yeah, in, almost no latitudinal dependence um, and high production uh, globally. For, for the for this time period. And that's not the case only for, for this time period. Uh, we, we found that for a period of about uh, 1600 years, which is actually the duration that we estimated for the Lachamp excursions, um, these uh, zonal profiles, they, they don't show latitudinal behavior. So basically we cannot use the assumption about the um, cutoff rigidity based on, on, on dipole field or axial dipole fields to be valid for, for the Lachamp event. And um, of course, I mentioned that the, the production depends on the two factors of the geomagnetic field and on the solar and the heliospheric magnetic field expressed here as a solar modulation. Um, and 
I, I tested a few cases, uh, a range of uh, values for, for the solar modulation from, from no solar mod modulation to, to 2000 megavolts. Uh, and I plotted again the, the LS mode here, uh, 10 bay global, 10 bay really global, global production in, in this period. And of course, when there is no um, shielding from the solar magnetic field, uh, what we see, the, the production is, is highest. Um, and actually the peak is when there is also no shielding in the geo, almost no shield, shielding of the geomagnetic field over, over the Lassamp exclusions. And when the values of the solar modulation are uh, high, then we don't, we, the signal that we ob ob observed or, or we get from the, from the geomagnetic field is uh, uh, suppressed, so we, we cannot see it very well. And you probably have seen this figure when uh, the production rate of cosmogenic isotopes is expressed uh, as a function of the two, and this is usually uh, based on numerical simulation. And this is the, the, the plot here, it's based on the LS mode. So it's uh, um, values from, from, from our models, and it's a summary of the period 50 to, to 30,000 years. Of course, we have uh, more points here when the field is um, Bit, bit higher dipole moment, but we have some some when it's low. And I used um, I used a, a, a 2D um, smoothing splines to, to, to get the surface because these are discrete points from, from the model. But in general, the production rate over the Lachamp excursion, the mean, uh, I'll go back a slide before here, um, the, the production rate, the mean production rate from the LS mode over the Lachamp excursion, um, it's uh, more than, than twice than the present day field. Also seen here in the in the three D plot. Um, and another interesting features uh, is the first uh, to see the robust features or to, to robust production because now we have a few models that cover this long time scale, so we can look at the production from all of the models. Um, and then um, uh, what we observe and from the 100K model, agree well with the Holocene here production. It's a bit, the production is lower um, than, than the other two, the, the, seven, the 70 k model and LS mode. And that's because the, the 100K predicts a little bit higher, uh, higher dipole moment, meaning higher shielding towards the cosmic rays. Um, and also it's smoother, but uh, the 70K and the LS mode, they agree well uh, over the overlapping period. And uh, I've also estimated the average production, hemispheric production, so Northern Hemisphere versus South and Atlantic Bitter Pacific. Uh, and because we, we observe this at, um, hemispheric asymmetry, at, at least we, we have a paper for the Holocene, for Holocene models when we have a lower field in the Southern Hemisphere and higher, higher variability. And this is reflected in the production rates and not only on the Holocene time scale, as you can see here. And this is an average over, over the period uh, this model um, cover. So in the in the present day field, IGRF in, in the Kalistan case on average over 10,000 years, then LS mode uh, in the 70K model. So it's a period 70 to 15,000 years ago and um, 100,000 100, years ago. They all show this uh, hemispheric asymmetry. So um, lower production in the Northern hemisphere, uh, higher production in the Southern hemisphere and no differences in the Atlantic versus Pacific. And, and because the, the estimates we have are, are 3D, basically 4D, because we have also the time dependence, uh, we see the production in the atmospheric column, uh, if here expressed uh, as atmospheric depth, or just to give you an idea about the, the altitude, so it's um, 20 kilometers to, to mean sea level, basically. Um, and th these are the same um, three epochs I've selected before for, for the global maps for the mean production. Um, the, the cells in these plots are been elevated, uh, but it's clear that the maximum production um, it's in the polar region when, when we have a, a dipole dominated field. This is, uh, and also actually here you can see uh, higher production in the, in the southern latitudes in the southern polar region compared to the northern. The, we, we have some still some dipolar structure visible and over the monolake excursion um, and um, maximum production everywhere for the, uh, for the Lachamp event. Um, and if we consider this 3D estimates and uh, the position of model, 
um, which is based on, on, uh, on atmospheric circulation, uh, we can deposit this production, this uh, beryllium 10 atoms in the, uh, on the surface of the earth and compare these, for example, as, as given here in the um, comparison with the, with the Greenland ice cores. So um, here, the, the three models, the 100K, the 70K, and the LS mode, and, and it's absolute. So it's a deposition of flux in absolute units. Um, and I, I think the, um, they, they, they fit the data quite well. Um, and last but not least, just to say that uh, the models and the data I've presented and uh, quotes for estimating um, predictions of the models as well as animation as, as given here, which I didn't have time to present, are all available online. So you can download and play with it and have a look. Um, the cutoff rigidity, which are the shielding of the geomagnetic field from the LS mode is also available. Uh, and all of the mo other models, this is a paper in, in review are also available and hopefully soon the production rates, you will find them also there. Um, so a quick summary, um, we are slowly moving, uh, moving towards, I think, uh, have global models on the longer and longer time scales beyond the Holocene. The one I presented covered three, three excursions, and then we can, having these models, we can first extract um, robust features of the, of the models of the geomagnetic field uh, and, and test this event, either similar or, or dissimilar. So the the most the best the best excursion or the the best global event is the, the La Champ, or the most recent. Um, and it's a uh, uh, we see from from the from our from our models uh, that um, it's it's a result of the axial dramatic axial dipole a decrease and uh, flux patches moving in the in, in both reverse flux patches in both hemispheres. Uh, so beryllium ten they have limited uh, I, I would say for the moment. Uh, uh, again, because of the data distribution, uh, uh, limited effect on the paleomagnetic field models, or maybe that the, as, as we saw that they show the, the they agree with the paleo, paleomagnetic records. And then uh, having the models, we can estimate the production rates um, and compare with the actual measurements. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Sanya. We can give Sanya a, a virtual round of uh, applause via the <coughs> Zoom reactions. That was a really interesting a uh, really interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I can open the floor to, to uh, questions. Um, so if somebody, if you would like to just raise your hand uh, via Zoom or uh, type a question into the chat, if anybody has one. Uh, Kathy. Yeah, I've got so many questions. I don't know where to start. That was a lovely, <laughs> lovely uh, uh, core dump of everything that you've done, Sanya. Really impressive. Um, so, uh, firstly, I wanted to uh, think about um, when you do the translation of um, beryllium 10 to dipole moment, um, it must, I'm just wondering how one characterizes the uncertainty in that, because it seems to me that there's a big issue in your modeling about the balancing of uncertainties and also about balancing the numbers of data regionally. and uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't think we really have a formal way of doing that. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Um, for, the, for the model I've presented, uh, beryllium 10, uh, we, we weight them the same as the paleomagnetic record, just we didn't want to, to put more weight on the, on the paleomagnetic on uh, beryllium 10. Um, I remember that uh, some of the beryllium records, unlike the, um, the paleo intensities or paleomagnetic data in general, uh, they do come with, with uncertainty estimates, actually. And for the first preliminary study I did on the 100K model, beryllium-10 records, I'm, I weighed them according to the uncertainty estimate. So if I have beryllium-10 with, with uh, uh, yeah, uncertainty, mm -hmm. I convert this to, uh, to paleo intensity with uncertainties. And maybe that's, that I should do now. So for the moment, the model I presented, it's, um, it's, uh, they're all equally weighted. So five, five microtesla for intensity, paleomagnetic, and beryllium-10. Uh, for the estimating uh, a certainty estimates on the model, uh, I haven't done this. I'm doing it in the moment for the 100K model and for the 70K. So I think um, we should discuss to put them this, uh, probably also update the faults in order with, with the certainty estimates. And I'm using the approach you have used before for the Holocene models. 
and uh, yeah, not to hog the, the floor, but uh, that the, it's very noticeable that there really aren't any records in the Pacific. Is there any hope for stuff there? Yes. Um, yes there <laughs> oh yes, but yes, there is. It's noticeable. I I, I know. I mean, and and some uh, some we have at least from the paleomagnetic uh, side, it's a uh, low resolution. So yeah. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, we'll hand over to, to, to Richard now. Hello, <laughs> lovely talk. Um, so my usual standard question is, you discard lots of data, and I fully get that, that you want to use high quality data, but how do the data you discarded, how do they look compared with the model? Some can compare well, other, others not. Um, it's a, I mean, for the for the hundred K model, when I when I include them, so it's a, it's a it's a large amount of data. That yes, I agree. Um, some agree well, other others not. So it, it seems like, um, and that approach was used in the LS mode. I think one one have to um, to use uh, maybe first to check or even create regional stacks if you wish, kind of. So the 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 records are consistent regionally. So but I found, and I think that's why I'm speaking about this loose criteria. We uh, we didn't select the data, and then uh, if if a record is with higher resolution, you fit this better than the others. Uh, I checked the, the 70k model. Yes, it's a really limited data distribution, uh, but I think for the period when uh, that overlaps with the LS mode, we have the similar variation. Right, because uh, yeah, Monica and I have had discussions on this, and she knows I'm far more open to, to grotty data and just letting the model model have a look at it and see what it comes up with. In particular, if you've got anything in the Pacific, but um, the the old uh, the quote that uh, inadequate data are far better than no data at all. So um, I mean, you can jiggle with the um, the uncertainties, but it would be nice to kind of squeeze more data and see at what point the model starts going mad because if nothing else, people have put a lot of work in collecting these data. Um, uh -huh. I've never done any of the work, but it would I have sympathy for them when uh, they get completely discarded. Uh, I agree, and I have to be honest that, uh, and, and that happened with, when, when doing modeling, that some good records came out after we did the model or even before publishing, but the, the records are constantly coming. So I think uh, it, it, there, there is a, uh, potential for for improving it for adding more records more good records let's say i would take um less good records with higher putting in higher variances and see what happens but that's, yes that's that's just me and yes. i don't i don't have to do the work so i'll shut well, up well I, I said this many many times uh, I, I think with these two models uh 70k and the 100k i was really going to extremes everything nine records probably the true maybe in between as you said to include more Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, are there any other questions for, for, for Sanya? So if nobody's going to put their hand up, I, I mean, I have a, a, a question. Um, when you're looking at the, the, the change in the power across the, the different excursions, the shop really jumps out as being a, a, a very large drop in the power. I mean, I'm wondering how much of that is in, in relation to the other excursions. I'm wondering how much of that is, is related to difference in the dynamics of these excursions and how much might actually be related to biases in the data. Le Champ is, is, is pretty well studied compared to the other excursions. Is it just that, that we have more data that are, are picking out um, you know, the resolution of, of, of the excursion better? Or is it that you know, maybe there are some differences in the dynamics? Um, I, I, would, I wouldn't say it's the data. I mean, if there are nine records, these nine records cover La Champ and Mono Lake and, and Norwegian Greenland Sea, and just by looking at the raw data, not, not the model, you see that the intensity, uh, also the direction, directional variations are large in the La Champ compared to the other. So, of course, the model it has uncertainties, the data as well, uh, but I don't think it's related to the data, at least like having. Um, 0.5% uh, of the present day model over the Lasham with 40% over Mono Lake or 20% over, over the Norwegian Greenland Sea. I, I don't think the synthesis is that big. I mean, I may prove wrong, but uh, um, I, I think these are this distinct event in terms of dynamics. Uh, and then I think it's, uh, it's just that some, some events are regional, some are global. 
And of course, uh, when, when I say, okay, we have this behavior now from the, from the Lachamp and the, the, the two other regional events, we, we need more excursions to really be sure uh, about claims, uh, what, what drives, is it, is it really only the axial dipole term that changes over excursion? So I think uh, there's more work to do on these longer excursions and compare it to the Lachamp. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for uh, another question. If anybody wants to 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 throw one sign his way, oh, we've got a comment um, uh, from Nick uh, Jabot in the chat. He says, "A nice talk." Um, do you have some ideas on how to measure the quality of data records so that they can be weighted uh, in the averages? Uh, very good question. I um, so these records we speak about sediments now because they are geomagnetic and volcanic, they, cut, they, they come with some uh, kind of a measure, let's say alpha 95, or we can, we can uh, assess the uncertainty somehow. For the, for the sediments, as we don't have, uh, I think the, the way to go will be, of course, for the moment, I, I put, I weighted everything equally. Uh, I did a study when I tried to, uh, I did that sort of on the whole in time scale, actually also in, on the 100K records uh, to, to fit spline, uh, just to judge or to assess the, the random variability in the records and and um, and get out the random uncertainty estimates compared with archaeo and volcanic to, to to see if there is some systematic bias. So that that's one way. And and uh, but what I learned from these studies is that we have a really diverse records. So for the 70k model, yes, I weighted everything equally. For the 100k, I think we, we did not weight them equally. Um, probably. Uh, checking regional consistency again and, uh, and, and getting some number that will be added to the random and the systematic. Uh, and I think there are some studies, maybe not on these time scales, but on a, on a shorter Holocene time scales that, uh, that incorporate all of these errors into one error and this is how they're weighted. So, thank you very much. Um, I'll draw, have to draw the uh, seminar to, to a close so we can save any last questions for for um, the uh, the catch up at the end uh, end of it all? So I just want to um, invite everybody to give uh, Sanya another virtual round of applause for uh, another great talk in our Magnet seminar series. So thank you very much uh, for coming and, and presenting to us today. Um, now before uh, everybody um, uh, leaves, just a quick uh, couple of uh, reminders for um, our seminar series. We have another. Uh, seminar series in a couple of weeks um, by from Gwyn Williams from Edinburgh. Uh, and then after uh, EGU, we will switch to a, a, an EU uh, Eastern Hemisphere time slot. So there will be a change uh, in the time of our magnet seminars. Um, and we'll run that slot from about uh, June to, to August or so. Uh, and there'll be more announcements about speakers that we have lined up for, for that session. And as always, we're looking for more uh, people to um, uh, to uh, present to the seminars, and in particular, we always encourage uh, early career speakers to put themselves forward for presenting a seminar. And uh, for anybody who has missed our seminars in the past, um, all of our, our recordings are on um, our YouTube channel, uh, so please um, uh, go on to there, subscribe for the announcements, and catch up with all the seminar series, going all the way back to our very first uh, seminars back in, in 2020. But uh, once again, thank you everybody for uh, joining Magnets uh, this week and we'll see you in a couple of weeks time. Cheers. <laughs>